In part 3, we discuss three important scriptural truths and practices we must be established in as we journey into emotional wellness. 1. Receiving the Father's love. 2. Being established in your identity in Christ. And 3. Releasing the past. We're going to rise up to our feet and uh, make our declaration. So uh, if you brought your Bibles with you, will you please let's all stand together and just hold your Bibles high up in the air with me. And let's all say this loud, bold and strong together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ. And a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word. And I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name. Amen. Two Sundays ago we started talking about emotional wholeness and deliverance. So we're going to be spending... Uh, several Sundays this month and next, uh, the month of August, just uh, working through uh, this whole study on emotional wholeness and deliverance. Uh, let me just quickly review some of the things we've already spoken, we've already said, and then we will go ahead uh, into uh, this morning's part of this series. The Bible tells us in 3 John in verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, that you be in health, even as your soul prospers. So our prospering, our being in health is connected to our soul prospering. And now there's nothing wrong to pray and say, God, I want to prosper. Because John is saying, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper. There's nothing wrong in saying, God, I want to be in good health. Nothing wrong. But that is all connected to the well-being of our soul, our emotional being. The soul which comprises of our mind, will, and emotions. Mind, will, and emotions. So the well-being of our soul, the health of our emotions is important, is what we said. And just as our body could have some problems and be unwell our soul could also have problems and be unwell and and so what we are looking at in the series is how can we receive God's healing in our soul and so that we could be whole and the Bible teaches us in Psalm 23 verse 3 he restores my soul God is a restorer of our soul he's the healer of our mind will and emotion. So when we began this series, in part one, we talked about the problems and causes, and I'm just uh, quickly reviewing. We said, you know, we could have problems in our soul, and it impacts our lives. Uh, the, our behavior, our choices uh, are affected by problems in the soul. Our emotional well-being, relational problems, how we relate with people, uh, life experiences, things that we go through in life are usually connected to problems in the soul and even our physical health, as we mentioned, are connected, uh, some of them are connected to problems in the soul. What are some of the causes? We mentioned about six of these. We said, first of all, at a very basic level, there could be wrong thinking. We are, uh, have wrong thinking patterns, wrong believing. Secondly, wrong speaking. We speak wrong words and they impact us. Or thirdly, continual deep-seated sin. If you're continuing in sin, that impacts our soul, our emotional well-being. Fourthly, they, we could have gone through trauma or adverse experiences in life, which impact us emotionally. Our mind, our, our emotions are affected. Fifthly, we talked about involvement in occult and false religions, that even demonic spirits affect our emotional state. There are spirits of depression, spirits of heaviness, and spirits of suicide and all kinds of things that cause us uh, uh, disturb our emotional state and that we usually open up the doors through involvement in a cult and false religions 
Uh, number six, we talked about ancestral commitments and practices. Last Sunday, we talked about receiving healing and deliverance. What we mentioned was that the restoration of our soul involves healing, deliverance, and a journey to wholeness. That means we need to be healed. God heals us from all, all the hurts and the wounds. We also need deliverance, which means we need to be set free from oppressive demonic spirits that affect our soul. But we must also journey, continue in this journey to a place of well-being. And that journey involves embracing certain scriptural truths and disciplines in our lives. It's not enough just to do the prayer that we did last Sunday. And that's important, healing and deliverance. Sure, that's important. We need to pray. Ask God to heal and expel uh, any evil, de demonic influence on our lives. So we need to do that. But we don't stop there. We need to journey forward. And that's what we want to talk about starting today. How do we journey into a state of emotional wholeness? How do we stay emotionally whole? What are good, healthy, spiritual disciplines the Bible teaches us that we should maintain as far as our mind, will, and emotions are concerned? These are things we're going to discover in the coming weeks. You all with me so far? So, today, as we, we want to talk about journeying into emotional wholeness. How, yes, last Sunday we prayed. We, 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 we spoke forgiveness. We broke away uh, the, the influence of evil spirits and all that. We, we did that. That's great. But now what next? How do we journey? How do we live this way? So that we can come to that place of emotional wholeness. Wholeness. I want to bring our attention this morning to three important spiritual truths and practices that you and I must maintain so that we can journey into being emotionally whole. The first is this. It's about receiving the Father's love. It's very important. Secondly, being established in your identity in Jesus Christ. And living out of that identity is very important to journey into a place of emotional wholeness. And thirdly, releasing the past, letting go of the past is also very important in order to journey into emotional wholeness. And so we're going to talk about these three things this morning. Number one, receiving the Father's love. All of us understand the Bible talks about God as our heavenly Father. Jesus said when you pray, our, you say our Father. God is our heavenly Father. But the Bible also says God is love. So you and I as believers, we have a Father in heaven who is a God of love. But we need to come to a place where we receive His love. We need to understand, receive a revelation of this love that He has for us and, and, and receive it for ourselves. And that, and live out of that consistently because that is the place of emotional wholeness that we need to enter into. What do we know about God's love, the Father's love for us. The Father's love is perfect love. It's love that you and I will never find on earth. His love for you is unlimited. It's immeasurable. It's unconditional. And it's unchanging. He loves you in the morning, at noon time, and in the evening. He doesn't have moods. <laughs> He's consistent in his love for you or me. His love is unconditional. It's not based on what you and I have done. You can never earn the love of God. You and I can only receive the love of God. His love is immeasurable. There is no measure. There is no dimensions that you can assign to the love that God has for you. Paul says his love, there is no height, no depth, no breadth. I mean, it's 
beyond measure, immeasurable, unlimited, unchanging. I just want to bring our attention to a few scriptures that just talk to us about the love of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is saying that he chose us, verse 4 through 6, he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God chose you. He decided that he's going to love you even before he created you. Even before the foundation of the world, God said, I'm going to love you. He chose us before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame. That means when God looks at you, he sees you're holy and there is no judgment, no condemnation coming through his eyes towards you. You're holy without blame in his eyes. Why? We are covered because we are in covered in his love. Holy and without blame in love. You're covered by his love. And you're standing before God, holy, without blame. This is in Jesus Christ. So many of us, we feel shame, guilt, condemnation. And, and, and so we feel like God is judging me. God is angry with me. God is mad at me. But the Bible says you're without blame before God. Covered in his love. And the next verse, verse 5, says that he has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. That means he decided ahead of time, I'm going to adopt you into my family. You belong. I love you so much, I'm making you my son or my daughter. I'm adopting you to my family. And then verse 6 says that... To the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. You are accepted, not rejected. You are accepted by God. So in his great love, in his immeasurable love, you are holy and without blame. You are his son or daughter, and you are accepted before him. Amen. And God did all of this for you and me, even when we were not seeking him. Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 4 to 7. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy, even with his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. God had this great love for you and me, even when we were dead in sins. So before you and I even had any inclination towards God, he said, I love you with this great love. When we were dead in sins, he said, I love you with a great love. And in his love, what did he do? It says he raised us up together and he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. He said, I love you so much. I'm bringing you out of the mire of sin. And I'm going to make you sit right next to me. That's the great love of God. Now, you and I, all we need to do is to receive this love, to be firmly established in this love. And just to let God love us because He loves us. He wants to love us. He desires to love us. He chose to love us. The Father's unlimited, immeasurable Unconditional love sets us free. It sets us free. Perfect love comes from only one source. It's God. Perfect love. And the Bible says perfect love drives out all fear. It banishes all fear. See, some of us live in fear. We're fearful. What if I lose my job? What if I don't have enough money for tomorrow. Fearful. So many things. We're living in fear. And you know, living in fear is as bad as living in hell. There are only two places that have torment. Hell and fear. If you're living in fear, it's as bad as living in 
fear has torment. But the Bible says perfect love banishes all. So when you receive this perfect love that comes from God, all fear is gone. Because you know you have a Father in heaven who loves you so much. He will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. He will never change his mind about you. He will never fail you. He will empower you. He, you are always accepted by him. And when you embrace, when you receive that love and say, yes, that's my Father. I'm settling down in that love. All fear is gone. You're not worried about tomorrow. Because you know, no matter what happens tomorrow, your Father in Heaven still... His love is unchangeable. Unconditional, unlimited, immeasurable. And it's going to be that, that way even tomorrow. So, I just put very quickly for some of the things that, that happen to us when we experience the Father's love. It's not a complete list. But when you experience the Father's love, it releases us from all every sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation. You know that you are holy and without blame covered by His love. When you experience the Father's love, it releases you from feeling unloved or rejected. Maybe people have rejected you, but the Father's love so overwhelms you, all that feeling is gone and you're not living in that anymore. Because you receive the Father's love. It releases you and me from the need to perform or earn love. Human love, you have to earn. You get 90, daddy loves you. 85, next time, try again. <laughs> human love is earned. That's the way we understand human love. But not with the Father's love. When we were dead in sins, yet He had this great love for us. You don't earn the Father's love. So you, when you receive the Father's love, you are free from any desire to perform to earn His love. You're released from all sense of unworthiness and worthlessness. Human love sometimes makes you feel so worthless because it was there yesterday and suddenly it's gone today. It's like, what happens? Suddenly, I was devalued in those very eyes. But not with the Father's love. And so when you receive the Father's love, your sense of unworthiness, worthlessness, you don't have that anymore because you know you're always accepted. You're adopted as your son, as daughter. It releases you from all feeling like a captive, somebody enslaved and trapped. Because he has not given you the spirit of slavery. He does not call you, he has not invited you to be a slave. He's calling you to be a son or daughter. It releases you from all sense of being controlled and manipulated and used. Sometimes human love is such that. At the end of it, you only feel used. They did it not because they valued you. They did it because they enjoyed what they got from you. But not so with the love of God, with the love of the Father. He empowers you through His love. It releases you from all fear, as we mentioned. So we must come to this place where we all simply receive the Father's love. In order to experience what his love does for us. That means you let him love you. Because he is love. Because he is your. You understand that you're loved. Not because you've been his best child. Not because you earned it. Not because you've done so much. But you let him love you. Because he is love. So, why don't we do that right now? Why don't we just, the sermon's not over, it's only one third. Of the way. <laughs> why don't we just, just close our eyes? I want to just pray and say, Father, I'm just 
giving you these words. You don't have to say these words. You can say it in your own words. But Father, I just receive your love. Thank you for making me your son, your daughter. Thank you, I'm holy. I'm without blame before you, covered by your love. I just receive your love because you want to love me. You love me. I'm loved by you. Immeasurably. Unconditionally. And unchanging way. Thank you, Father. Whatever else you want to say about his love for you and what his love means to you, just go ahead and pray. Just tell him. Father, thank you. You love me at, when I'm at my best and you love me when I'm at my worst. You love me the same. Father, even now as we receive your love, I pray over every person here, God, every feeling of unworthiness, worthlessness, being used, being rejected, all, all, all of these negative things just flow away, just be washed away by your love. Because it's your love that's perfect love. Thank you, O God. We receive in Jesus' name. Now, you and I must walk in the Father's love every day. So, Monday morning you get up, you go to, the, go to your office, your boss stares at you. My father still loves me. <laughs> Afternoon, things haven't gone so well. My father still loves me. Come home at night. On the evening, chapati has not yet been made and <laughs> dinner has to be cooked. No, my father still loves me. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, your heavenly father still loves you. Where things go good or things go bad, your heavenly father still His love is perfect. People may reject you. Your Heavenly Father has accepted you. People may accuse you. You're holy without blame in His eyes. You've got to rest in that love. There's a beautiful scripture in Zephaniah 3, verse 17. It says, He will quiet you with His love. When you receive His love, you're in a place of Rest, peace. He will quiet you with his love. So you walk in that place of quietness, rest, when you have received his love. Sure, things may not always be perfect around you and me, and you know, we have our challenges, but he quiets us with his love. Amen. But there's there's a whole lot more that we can talk about it, but this is the first truth that we must all embrace. My father loves me. I'm walking in that love. It just brings so much healing to us. Secondly, we must be established in our identity in Christ. I know we've talked about this many, 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 many times and we probably will keep on talking about it many, 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 many more times. An analogy that we use often is that, you know, suppose there was a, 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 a street kid Abandoned by his parents. And he was out on the streets. No home. Nothing. Totally abandoned. Just living off the garbage. And, and not knowing what tomorrow brings. Living just for the moment. But there comes a rich man. And, and he takes the street kid. And adopts him into his own family. And makes him his own son. Gives him his name. Gives him great clothing. And, and, and lavishes him with all his riches. If the street kid still lives with the street kid mentality, everything this rich man did, so no use. 
Now, many of us believers, we continue to live with a street kid mentality. Even after our Heavenly Father has brought us into Christ. The Bible says that when you and I became believers, we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. That moment, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everything about you has changed in an instant. When you believed in Christ, your spirit, who you were, your identity in the realm of the spirit changed. In the natural, sure, you were the same person and everything. But in the spirit, your identity shifted. You became a new creation. You became somebody who was in Christ Jesus. And from that moment on, God desires for you and me to live out of that identity rather than continue living like a street kid, abandoned. But this is a journey of discovery. We need to first of all understand who we are in Christ and then begin to live out of that. And so we continuously reaffirm and teach and emphasize this truth that we must be established in this identity and live out of that. And you and I should make no apologies for living out of the life you and I have in Christ because Jesus paid a great price to make that available to you and me. So you make no apology for living with your, uh, with your head held up high, your shoulders put back, walking as a son or daughter of God, knowing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ, knowing that you're loved, you're accepted, that you're always blessed. You make no apology for it because Jesus made a great price to give that to you and me. We must live out of that identity. When you and I are established in our identity in Christ, this transforms the way we relate to God. Sometimes it's so sad for believers to go and pray, oh God, I'm such a sinner. You were a sinner, but now in the New Testament, you're called a saint. So why don't you call yourself what God calls you? Why don't you say, God, I thank you. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I'm no longer a sinner, but I've been washed, I've been sanctified, I've been justified. Call yourself what God calls you. Amen? I'm preaching it a little hard so that at least this time we'll get in. <laughs> no, because this is so important for us as believers. It changes the way you relate to God. You now relate to Him. As who you are in Christ. Somebody who is without any condemnation. Somebody who is justified in the eyes of God. Somebody who has peace with God. Somebody who is made righteous in his eyes. That you can come boldly to him and talk to him. It transforms the way you look at yourself. You don't look at yourself as a failure. As an accident. As a misfit. You look at yourself as somebody who is in Christ, who has a divine purpose here on earth, that you are a co-worker with Jesus Christ, you are on heaven's assignment, you are here with a purpose, and you are going to do great things for the kingdom of God. You see yourself as a man or woman who is anointed by the Holy Spirit, through whom the glory of God will be revealed, through whom the sick will be healed, the devils will be cast out, and the dead will be raised, and God will further his kingdom here on earth. That's who you are. So how you see yourself changes. It changes the way you relate to people. Others can be mean to you, but you say the love of God is poured into my heart and I'm going to love. You'll be a peacemaker when others cause trouble. The way you relate to people now flows out of your life that you have in Christ Jesus. He is the vine, you're a branch on the vine. So what's in him comes through you. And nothing bad comes out of him. Amen. When you and I are established in our identity in Christ, it changes the way, it transforms the way we face life situations. No matter how high the storm, you know that the Lord is king who sits above the storms. No, high, no matter how high the mountains you face, you know God can move every mountain out of your way. So you now face 
life with a sense of confidence. You know that God will always cause you to triumph according to his words. You know that in Christ you are an overcomer because you're born of God. Amen? And it transforms the way you stand up against the devil. See, as a believer, you don't say, oh, I'm scared of what, what the devil will do to me. You never say that. As a believer, you've got to be saying, I know the devil's scared of what I'll do to him. And when you go into a place that is infested with devils, you're not worried like, oh, I wonder what the devil's going to do to me. No, you're, you're like, man, I know the devil is on the run. Those demons are on the run. Because I'm a man or woman, a son or daughter of God. I come with heaven's authority. I come with heaven's backing. I come under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I come in the name of Jesus. I come clothed with the armor of God, washed in the blood with the word of God. That's who you are. Amen. So when you and I are established in our identity in Christ, we no longer... Walk around with a sense of self-worth, a poor self-image, I cannot do, feelings of insufficiency, lack, fear. All these things are broken off because you are abiding in Him and you're living out of that life that you have in Christ. In our church app, we have, a, under toolkit, we have a little box that says identity. And there we try to put on all the scriptures that teach us about our identity in Christ. And I'm just going to quickly read that. In case you haven't still checked it out. <laughs> but I encourage you to get the church up and look at that. And just read that off and remind yourself of who you are in Christ. But in Christ you are a child of God. You are a new creation. You are abiding in Him. You are alive with a new life. You are an heir of God. You are a joint heir with Christ. You are assured of all the promises of God. You are blessed with all the blessings of God. You are delivered you are enriched. You are established in God. Nothing can shake you. You are filled with God's fullness. You are free from the law. You are free from worthless rituals and traditions. You have been given abundance of grace. Therefore, you reign in life. You have been given eternal life. You've been given wisdom from God. You have become God's dwelling place. God lives in you. He walks in you. You have been identified with Christ's death so that the, po the power of sin over your life has been broken. You are justified. You stand before God just as if you never sinned. You are loved by God. You are one body with other believers in Christ. You are one with Jesus. You are united with him. You are part of God's eternal purpose on the earth. You are preserved. You are raised up with Christ and made to sit together in heavenly realms. You are redeemed. You are the righteousness of God. You are sanctified, made holy unto God. You are sealed with God's mark of ownership on your life. You are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. You are victorious because God always causes you to triumph. You are walking in him and in him you live and move and have your being and you await the resurrection. That's who you are. Amen. And you and I, we live out of this identity. This is who I am. This is what God has done for me. So I want to encourage you. Live out of that. And make no apologies to live out of your identity in Jesus. This is going to bring us to that place of emotional wholeness. The last thing I want to mention here today, this morning, as we journey into emotional wholeness, is to learn to release the past. I think all, all of us, it would be right to say all of us, or at least almost all of us, have had difficult things happen to us in our past. We may have gone through difficult situations in life. We may have gone through experiences where people have hurt us, betrayed us, abused us, mistreated us. We may have gone through situations that made us angry with God, questioned God, because we didn't understand why those things happened. And all of those kinds of things. Everyone has a story. And some of us may have had many such difficult experiences in life. Now, we cannot undo our past. 
Neither should we pretend that those things never happened. That's not the right way to live. But we can release the past. We must not permit the past to hold us captives. We cannot permit the past to keep us from the great future that God has for us. And we must not look at our future through the lens of our past. Now so imagine this. You can't drive a car looking at the rear view mirror all the time. Some of us have our eyes stuck on the rear view mirror. And we want to go forward. And we're making no progress. We're still, we've gotten off the road somewhere. Or we crashed into something. And we're wondering why. Because your eyes are still stuck on the rear view mirror. Now occasionally you can look at it because we do, must learn lessons from our past. Not repeat the same mistakes. But if you and I have to journey into our, our future, we've got to release the past so that we can go into what God has for us. It doesn't matter what the past is. Even if you and I have made some grave mistakes, if even if you and I have gone through some tormenting, troublesome situations in the past, we must learn to release it. There are some great stories in the Bible. And I want to just quickly remind you of two. One is that of a man named Jacob in the Old Testament. You know, he cheated his brother, his brother Esau, his twin brother Esau. He cheated him, stole his birthright. And in that culture, in those times, birthright was a big thing. He stole that. And then he ran away. 20 years have gone. God's been gracious to him. God's blessed him. He's married, family, everything. But now 20 years later, he decides to go back to his own home country. But there's a problem. He has to face up with his past. He has to meet Esau. So as he journeys back, he's just a little distance away. And he sends word to his brother Esau, I'm coming home. Just wants to get a feel of whether Esau is going to welcome him or not. And the next thing he hears is, Esau is coming to meet you. But he's coming with 400 men. <laughs> Jacob is scared. 400 men, that's not a good sign. <laughs> what do I do? So Genesis 32 records that night. The next day he's going to meet Esau. And the night before he, he's crying out to God. Oh God help me. I've got to meet Esau. And as he cries out to God in his desperation, as he prays, he has an encounter with God. And what does God do? God says, I'm changing your name from Jacob to Israel. I'm changing your identity. Because as a man, you have engaged with God in such a way that you are a prince with God. You have stature before God. So go meet Esau, not as Jacob, but as Israel. A man with a different identity. And Esau could not take that away because Jacob did not, did not get that from any man. He got it from God himself. His new identity came from God. There's a lesson for you and me. You know, we may have done all kinds of things in the past and but when we go and face up to it, we face our past not as Jacob, but as Israel. We face our past out of our identity in Christ, of what God has done in our lives through Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a story of a man named Joseph. In fact, Joseph was one of Jacob's sons. Now, Joseph must have been just a teenager, maybe 13, maybe 15. When all of his brothers ganged up against him and decided to get rid of him. They sold him as a slave. 
because he was his father's favorite. They couldn't take him. They sold him off as a slave. Talk about being rejected, talk about abuse, talk about injustice, talk about mistreatment. Joseph had it. Not from one brother, but from ten others. And then he goes to Egypt, he, he gets a job to work for Potiphar, he's working faithfully, doing the best he can. And there he gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar, the man for whom he's working so faithfully, does not do anything to defend him. And so Joseph is thrown into prison. Now, if any, there was anybody who could have hurt and pain and emotional trauma because of what they've gone through, Joseph surely could have carried those wounds in his heart. Against his brothers, against Potiphar's wife, and even against Potiphar. Why didn't he stop it? Why didn't he defend me? I was such a faithful worker in his house. But as Joseph just continued in his faith in God, God changed everything, brought him out of that prison, made him prime minister and blessed him. And in those first seven years, he got, he was married and he had two children. And here's what Joseph says in Genesis 41 verses 51 and 52. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I like to read it from another version. The basic Bible in basic English, verse 51 says, He gave the first name, he gave the first son his name, Manasseh, for he said, God has taken away from me all memory of my hard life and of my father's house. Doesn't mean Joseph forgot everything, but the pain of that. The trauma, the negative feelings connected to those things were gone. God has healed my memory. Of my father's house, meaning those ten brothers. My hard life, meaning all that I went through, the humiliation, the accusation, all that I went through here. God has taken it off. And he says, God has made me to bear fruit in the land of my sorrow. In the same place where there was pain, I'm now fruitful. God can do that for you and me. Amen. Because all of us have gone through things. I don't think there's anybody who can say, you know, I've never had any problem. Maybe a few, very few. Most of us, we've gone through stuff in life. But we cannot let the past cripple us. And there is a God in heaven. Who can release our memory from the pain. The hurt. The bitterness. The negative emotions. That actually cripple us. That hold us down. So what do we need to do? There's four things here I'm going to mention here. First of all, you and I need to give up our rights. Give up your right to hold on to your past. To hold your past against God, against others, or even against yourself. Give it up. Don't hold your past against God. God, where were you when all this was happening to me? Did he fall asleep or something, God? Why didn't you stop it? Give up that right to hold your past against God. Give up your right to hold your past against others. Why did they do this to me? Or I hate them for what they did to me. Give up your right to hold your past against people. And give up your right to hold your past against yourself. I can't forgive myself for what I did. Give it up. Second place, your past in God's hands. 
There's only one who can remove our past and cause old things to pass away. It's the Lord Jesus. There's only one who casts our sins into the depths of the sea. There is only one who removes our sins away as far as the east is from the west. There is only one who says your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. He is the one who makes all things new. He can do that. So you place it in your hands. You place the people in your past to hurt you. Put them in the hands of the Lord. The negative emotions that keep coming back, place it in the hands of God. The, the events that caused you pain, put that in the hands of the Lord. You release that into the hands of the Lord. Thirdly, you and I release forgiveness to people. This is so important. We talked about it last Sunday. Because the measure to which we experience the power of forgiveness in our God's forgiveness in our lives is connected to the measure of forgiveness we extend to people. Forgive us as we forgive those. So we must forgive. It doesn't mean they were right. It doesn't mean their choices were right. But I'm still forgiving. It doesn't mean what they did is acceptable. No, I'm still forgiving. God will deal with that issue. My responsibility is to forgive. And fourthly, we must stand firm in our decision because sometimes these things tend to keep coming back often until you stand firm. Those negative emotions may come back. Those thoughts may come back. Those accusations may come back. Wanting to occupy your mind once again. But you stand firm in your decision that you've given up your right to hold on to the past. I no longer hold on to it. I don't no longer hold on to the people. I no longer hold on to the emotions. I no longer hold on to the events. I've given it up. And you stand firm in your decision that the people, the emotions, the hurts, and the events, you have actually released it in the God's hands. You're not going to go and get, take it from there again. It's in his hands. He's the one who makes all the old things pass away. I'm not going to go pull it back. So you stand firm. In that decision. I'll close with these verses from Isaiah 43. i just call our worship team up please. And the Lord says in Isaiah 43, 18. Do not remember the former things. Not consider things of old. I mean don't go back and keep on thinking about the past. Look. He says in verse 19. I will do a new thing. This time it's going to prosper. This time it's going to be successful. And I believe God can do new things in your life and mine. But he's telling us, you don't live in the past. You don't go back there. Isaiah 54 verse 4, he says, Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced. For you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth. The things that have happened in time past. God says, I'll take it out. Heal you of the painful memories. You will not remember the reproach, the shame of your widowhood anymore. And Isaiah 61 verse 7, he says, instead of your shame, you will have double honor. He's our God. He can do that. So if you and I are to journey to emotional wholeness, three important things. One, receive the Father's love. Let His love meet all your emotional needs. Your sense of security, self significance. All of that comes because and from his love. Live out of your identity in Jesus Christ. God has paid a great price for that. Live out of that. And thirdly, release your past. And this is something we have to do every day. Every day you live like this. Because sometimes, there may be times you've got to face up with Esau. It's coming down the road. You've got to say hi. But he has released you. 
you are Israel, saying hi to Esau. You have a new identity. The shame, whatever, the negatives, it's all gone. Like Joseph, God heals you from the pain and the shame. He releases you. So, I'd like us just to remain seated for a few moments, please. I want to give you this time to pray, please. Would you just say, Father, I receive your love in my life. And I'm from this day, I'm going to live out of my identity in Jesus, what you've done for me in Christ. Would you pray that in your own words, please? And would you do these four things we spoke about in order to release your past? And I think maybe all of us would need to do something. Number one, would you give up your right to hold on to the past? Just say, God, I'm letting go. I'm not going to use my past against you. I'm not going to use my past against other people. I'm not going to use my past against myself. I'm letting go. And would you place your past in God's hands? Think about the people who may have hurt you. Think about the events that just went wrong and were painful in your life. Think about the emotions that seem to keep coming back. Would you take this and put it in his hands? Say, Lord, this moment I'm putting all of this in your hands because you're the God who can make all things new. And if there are people that you need to forgive, would you just mention their names and say, God, right now I forgive them. I release your love towards them. And would you just say, God, help me to stand by this decision to release my past. Loving Holy Spirit, even as we sit here in your presence, as we are in your presence, I ask that you will do what the Word says, Lord, that you will cause us to be released from the memory, of the pain, pain of the past. You cause us to forget the shame, forget the hurt, the pain. All over this place, Bring healing, Father. Bring healing by your Holy Spirit. Set us free, Lord. And instead of shame, let us have double honor. Cause us to be fruitful. Where we once saw pain and sorrow and turmoil, cause us to be fruitful. In those very areas of our lives, let us not give up thinking that just because of the pain, we could never be fruitful in those areas. You're the God who makes all things new. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I speak over your life and I say God makes all things new in your life. God makes all things new. You will have honor instead of shame. In Jesus' name, in those areas where there was pain and shame and hurt, you will bear much fruit. I declare in Jesus' name that you are a tree of the Lord's planting, a tree of righteousness. That you will be beautiful, fruitful, flourishing. I declare in Jesus' name, complete release. From the hurts and the pains of the past. In the name of Jesus. 
be free, be made whole. He restores your soul. He restores your soul. A few more moments in God's presence. Let's rise to our feet, please. Just pray that 
that by your Holy Spirit, you will cause all of us, each one of us, Lord, to just grow in our understanding of the Father's love. We only begun to scratch the surface, God. We only begin to get a little understanding of how much you love us. Take us further, God, in this. Help each one of us to live out of what you've done for us in Christ. I pray that each one of us will walk totally free from our past. And literally, God, the past is behind us and has no more hold over us. That we walk completely free in the future that you have for each one of us. Thank you. Before we close, just want to take a few moments to give an opportunity for anyone here who has never received Jesus Christ into your life. Maybe you've gone to church many times. Maybe you've heard many messages about Jesus, but you've never personally said, Lord, forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. Save me, save me. If there's anyone here, you've never done that. I want to just pray with you, give you an opportunity to do that. Would you just pray this prayer with me if you've never done this before? Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my life. Make me a child of God. And help me to follow you the rest of my life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each one of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good Sunday afternoon, rest well, and enjoy your week. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website, apcwo.org, for additional resources. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.